how have you not exactly. seen that movie? Exactly, saying yes. that in my ears. Right. right. This is my life. They go, hey, have you seen this movie? And I go, no. And then uh, they go higher pitch. It's right. like five octaves higher than their normal voice. How have you not seen that movie? Yes, right. Exactly. exactly. That's yes. my whole life. <laughs> yo, 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 what's up? This is Chris Sims. Chris Sims, I'm Button. And this is not Siskel and Ebert next to me. That's for sure. It's Ahmed Fareed. Even better. Thumbs up to yeah, that. Even right? better. Even better. Even better. Well, no they were doubt. pretty good. They were, they were, were, were kind of good. Yeah, They're and iconic. they watch movies, so they have that advantage <laughs> on you, at least in that department. But what's up? Chris Sims, I'm Button, presented by Under Armour. Hope everybody's good. Week 14, almost in the books. We still got a great game tonight with Rams. Cardinals that I'm excited Ooh. about. We had a great day yesterday. The games were, I think there was a lot of, I don't want to say surprises, I guess surprises because of blowouts. And then we were treated to a few crazy finishes that I yeah. think were really cool. And some were, you know, cool throughout. Others were like, whoa, this team's dominating and how are they getting back? But nonetheless, never dull for excitement in the NFL. There are storylines for every team, regardless of how the game went. Yeah. But there were a lot of games that, yeah, it was like blowout Sunday. And then some of those games, though, got close. It was like a handful of them yeah, got close. Right. Teams were able to hang on. Uh, it wasn't like the the victor changed it all. But uh, but no, I, I think are the better teams separating from the where? I, like I don't I even think they are. I think you we're do seeing think it, they I think are. The last you, two weeks, I think we're seeing that a little bit. But more. I see some weaknesses in some of the good teams, yeah. you know, like the Dallas Cowboys, a team that we were sure. really high on a while sure. ago. It's like offensively, they got some issues. Yeah, they do. We're going to break into that too, and I, I, I hopefully can pinpoint a few things for for you. I again, of course, haven't watched that film yet, but I've watched them pretty closely on a weekly basis, so we can hit that for sure. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, we saw the Bucks and them kind of fizzle out as the game went on, right? That was interesting. The Bears jump out to a lead against the Packers. Yep. But I think we got a lot to talk about. One thing I do get, and I know you've heard me talk about this, this is going to be a discussion later in our podcast. Because I do have like people who are like, well, why are there more blowouts this year in the NFL? Mm. And you know my answer. Mm-hmm. You know what it is? Uh, I know what it yeah, is. Yeah, aggressive. Aggressive, right. Because now everybody, when the game's 10 nothing, it's, whoa, whoa, we might lose control of this. We're on our own 40 or our own 30 yard. we got to go for it on fourth and one. And now they're down 17 nothing, And it just compounds itself to where, I don't know, again, in the old days, that would not happen. Yeah. It would not, and I'm you would all t- for you would take your seven that. point loss like a man. You wouldn't you wouldn't lose by well, twenty one. I, I would I would manage it to keep it to around a seven point loss instead of just going. Wait, I know the future and I understand the next three quarters because I'm the wizard of Oz over here, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna be able to figure out how the game's gonna go and put it all down to this play. That that makes no sense to me. It's, and again, yeah. I know we're gonna have some discussions about this as we go on. And you and I are on a little bit of the uh, different a sides of this, bit, yeah. which is which is fun it because is fun. I am I'm a stan. I am yeah. a Chris Sims stan. Like it, when people attack you, whether they be Tua lovers or not, right. I will always back you up. But this right. is one of the rare instances where we have different opinions. Which I think is is good and healthy for our relationship. I think we need that uh, every once in a while. Definitely, like I know. a little push and pull. I, I yeah, I, that's right. I don't need you jocking me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just ninety eight percent of the time. All right, we'll get that two percent occasional here today. occasional pushback. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get into some of the big games here. We we will end with we unfortunately have to lay some teams to rest today. Maybe fortunately for them and their fan bases, four teams officially eliminated. Yep. From the postseason. Yep. The Detroit Lions, my Detroit Lions being one of those. So the return of Requiem, Requiem for, for a team. team. I've yeah. written little poems for four teams here. I love it. I so love it's like it. your, your playoffs are done. You're not going, but you get a poem by Ahmed Fari. All right. How long does it take you to write these poems? Because, like, I mean, I, you didn't know you were doing this until last night. So, no, I did them during when we were all in that room. You know, me, you, Breeze, Oh, so you Tariqo. felt this coming on oh, yesterday. Yeah. Pete texted me. He was like, hey, heads up. Yeah. These teams are bad, and they might be eliminated very right. soon. I was like, all right, thanks, Pete. Wow. And so I just started writing them because I was like, if it's not this week, it'll be next <laughs> it'll week. It'll be next week. So <laughs> or the week now. after. Right. So okay. I could probably do about half the league right now. But actually, no, because there's still a lot of teams still in it, like the Atlanta Falcons, crazily enough. All yes, right, we'll get to them. We'll get to all that coming on. Yep. Let's start with the team that uh, that won the Super Bowl last year. And this is kind of like the big comebacks that fell short. Yeah. This is what I was talking about. Pete right. has grouped them here together. We start with the Buccaneers. They hang on. In overtime it took, which boggles the mind if you just saw the first half of that game. You thought that the GOAT and Tom Brady and everyone were going to just roll the bills. But no, Buffalo came back with Josh Allen, 33-27 to in overtime. I know you want to talk about your, your good friend, Josh Allen, who I, I clearly, I think, was the best player on the field Thank you. in the yes, game right. yesterday. I mean, you right. can't watch that game and think anything other. But let's just start real quick with the yeah. last play right. in overtime here because you got that great comeback by the Bills, yeah. and then you 
Buccaneers have it in overtime. Right. And the final play, we broke it down on the Peacock show yeah. last night. Right. Uh, Brashad Perryman, who plays for the Bucks. Yeah. I think a lot of people, we, oh, hey, he plays for the Bucks now. That's right. interesting. And right. he's catching a, a long touchdown to win it. Uh, you broke down this play. What did you see from that final play in this great classic yeah. game? Yeah. Well, hey, the, the, the Bills are smart. They understand, like, when they play certain coverages, what the vulnerabilities are within that coverage, right? They're, they're good that way. So they never, like, just go, oh, we're going to play this coverage. And, man, if they call this play, we're screwed, right? Yeah. Now, they end up getting screwed on this play. But it wasn't because, like, the thought process was wrong. They, they just didn't execute it the right way. And, of course, the Bucks give you a lot to think about. And, really, they put Tremaine Edmonds, the middle linebacker, who's a phenomenal football player in a tough spot. But, you know, on that play uh, specifically, you know, it's man-to-man coverage by the Buffalo Bills. You got a bunch set to your left. It's three receivers. You know, Gronk is one of those three receivers over there to the left. And they're in, yeah, what we would call a bunch where three guys are somewhat close to each other. Well, what happens a lot of the times in those kind of sets? You know, guys get picked, especially yep. if you're playing man. They can't find ways to kind of weave everybody together. And now one guy gets caught in the traffic and, whoa, I can't cover this guy on a shallow cross. Well, on the other side of the formation, so you got the three receivers to the left. You got Mike Evans to the right on a tight split, what we would call. He's close to the tackle at the end of the line of scrimmage, which is usually a red light for a defense to go, oh, wait, here comes crossers. There's a bunch over here. There's a guy over here to cut down his uh, time to come across as well. Here comes crossers. So they're playing man. McDermott, Leslie Frazier is smart to know that could be a pick play. Yep. It could be that. And they try to pass things off because it's not realistic to ask your guys to go, wait, we want you to run across the middle of the field and cover a guy that runs 4-4 yeah. and then weave through traffic and stay with them. Right. And like, that's not, that's not possible, right? Yeah. So they try to pass it off. Within that, Tremaine Edmonds is responsible for Perryman. He's the guy that's got to kind of pick him up, knowing that uh, Perryman came from the outside of the bunch to the left, knowing that that corner is not going to be able to fight through the traffic and get there. And, in fact, the corner that's on Perryman, he stops because he goes, wait, here comes Mike Evans, and he's got the corner on the other side beat. I'm going to stop him so he can't do it because he's expecting Edmonds is going to pick up my guy. Edmonds looks at the receiver, gets caught back looking at Brady for a minute and follows his eyes. And then realizes, oh, no, I've lost track of my guy. And you could see, like, he looks at it and he tries to take off running even before Brady throws the ball, but it's too late, gone, touchdown. Great play by the Bucks. Yep. You know, messing it up a little bit there by the Bills, who i got to give a lot of credit for their their fight to come back in this one. And Perryman said after the game that that play was basically it's really designed to Evans. get Mike Evans right. open. And right. it just happened to be that Perryman got open, and that's why Tom Brady is one of the best to ever do it. You no know, doubt. He identified that immediately. Yes. No pause. Right. And threw it to Perryman, and the, and the rest is history there. Usually the the guy that's underneath right there there's two crossers the guy that's underneath is the yeah. one they're trying to go to because he he can go he knows and his teammate knows hey i'm coming right we're going to create a rub here and i'm going to come underneath you but they set them up by almost running right at each other so then he takes the little oh, I'm going to go under, and that's usually what sets the pickup because now the DB who's following him yeah, at that last second when he comes underneath him runs into the other guy and you're right. wide open. But that did not happen, and Brady, like you said, great feel instincts to kind of see that pop open. I can already hear Bills fans saying that that should never have even happened because of a couple calls that happened before sure. that. And we'll get into, you know, yeah. we have talked about the officiating a yeah. little bit here in the past. And yeah. I know there are some Bills fans on Twitter, and I was reading the tweets talking about the potential pass interference on Stephon Diggs What's in the problem? fourth quarter. Yeah. You, you didn't think it was pass interference, I, I didn't right? think it was horrible. I did not. You know, again, you know me. I'm, I'm one to would look. Would have been a game-winning touchdown if they can or you put him at the one-yard line gotcha. and then get it. You know, they would have won in regulation. I know. If they now, this, where there. I struggle with those, and again, I'd like to watch it on film a little too so yeah. I could really look at it, is just that, you know, first off, when I see those plays a lot of the times, the offense creates the initial contact. Like so, there's there's digs, yes. and he knows he's gonna go run and then put on the brakes. So he gets his hands on the guy early, so he can kind of push the guy up field. And then that's where Carlton Davis, like he's he's not an idiot. He goes, well, I think I know what's coming. So he starts to kind of hold and hand wrestle, uh, hand wrestle as well. Mm-hmm. Now we're accustomed. Again, this the issue is this. Probably 99 out of 100 times in the first three quarters, the first three and a half quarters, it gets called pass interference. And that's where I think people go, wait, wait, 
this was interference all game, but now here we are in a crucial part. It's not. And to yeah. me, that's the inconsistency that's going on in the refing in the NFL right now. But I don't really have an issue with that one. I don't. And um, Did you have more of an issue with the one that Mike Evans actually got in overtime? Underthrown ball. He's coming back I to the I don't like ball. those. Yes. I, don't, I hate those. Now, I, I hate did, those. Now, a little goes into some, They always get called. I think that needs to change. I, I, I'm with you, too. We'll get, with too much bad offense is being rewarded in football right now. Oh, the protection was bad. Nobody's open. The quarterback held the ball. And, oh, he got hit too hard. Oh, free, free first down. Oh, he threw the ball into quadruple coverage. It was a horrible decision. And he underthrew the f- ball. And everybody ran into each other because everybody has a right to the ball. Oh, pass interference on the defense. What? What? I mean, offensive pass interference never gets called. And to your point, yes, I don't like that. Now, what teams got to change, and some of the good teams are changing this, is you, you got to stop, like, turning into the receiver to stop those plays, yeah. right? They have no sight on the football. But if you're running and you're trying to keep up with the receiver, you are facing the receiver. And if that ball is thrown well, you're in a better spot than, it, you know, if that ball's underthrown, it's like, it's almost like the the defensive player is not given the right for where their body currently is. It's like no. if you're standing in between the ball. He has a ball, right to that spot. The receiver's go, trying to go through he the defender. He has a right to that it's spot. It's like the dude's standing but right there. But he also cannot impede the receiver's ability to go catch the football. And yeah. that's where, okay, he has a right to the spot. And now that's where I go, he's got to turn his head. See, this this became a thing in the NFL in the last 10 or 15 years. When I was growing up or watching my dad play, the, 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 the DBs ran down the field and they – track the ball like the wide receiver they didn't go I'm just gonna look at the receiver and wait till he puts his hands up and then try to knock the ball out that way that's what's leading to a lot of those interceptions on the underthrown balls or the jump balls or whatever else and I wish they'd change that and you're seeing some of the better defenses and DBs are changing that you yeah. know because yeah, well why I mean you got feel he's right there he's on your left hand left shoulder you got to feel for him turn around play the ball once you get downfield um, but yeah that was that was I don't like that but I understand them calling it, and you know me. I'm not the one that kind of like favors offense here on this kind of discussion. No. I think they overdo it with pass interference. I think they can call offensive pass interference a whole lot more than they actually do. Um, and, yeah, you are – and to what Brady has always said, you're rewarding really a bad throw and a bad play. Uh, but I also would say Buffalo, turn around and play the ball. Uh, so that last throw from Tom Brady was yeah. a good play and a good throw. His 700th career touchdown, including playoffs. It's amazing. I don't know what happened with the ball. I haven't heard the story they, on that. They went and got it, like, right away. Same was, thing? Yes. Oh, they were there. No, they yeah. were there. Like, the ball boy like the or whoever was, like, and... was all over it. I read an article this morning. And it was like it was like on their mind, their radar. They went and got it right it away. Was, it was like so. There you oh, go. Oh, here it is. There you you go. See, it. I told oh, you. Wow. I, I I read a story this morning about it. So they weren't going to let this one go. And it's like the ball boy that like the Bucks and Brady. Like at the one yard. No, he's he's in the end zone here. That would have been funny if they tackle him like right after he crosses. Give us that ball. Like, like five ball boys come and tackle him and take the ball away from. Him. What if what if Perryman wanted to keep that ball? It was a significant touchdown for him. Yeah, you're right. He was just like, no, this you're is right. mine. I know. I'm gonna keep this yeah. one. You're right. He give, should be like, give me Bitcoin. Yeah, he's Tom. like, he's like, Brady, give me a hundred thousand. <laughs> Screw you. I'm keeping this. <laughs> I haven't been in the league all that much here lately. Right. Um, okay, so that was a, first half was great for Tampa. I mean, they're up yeah. twenty four to three at halftime, and then the second half was the Josh Allen show. We got Derek Rudolph saying, "Damn, okay, yeah, Josh Allen yeah. is a warrior." Right. I think we have his first half versus second half numbers here. Uh, I mean, first half. I don't know. I think I saw this somewhere, Pete, and maybe you can check. I don't think a, like a running back ran the ball in the first half. They, I know they had very few. First time in three decades of running, they had four four rushes, but that was all Josh Allen. Is that what happened there? Or, I, yeah, that's what Pete's saying. So I was like, it's it, it is all Josh Allen. And in the second half, <laughs> it was all Josh Allen, and he put the team on his back. Hey, l- listen, Brady's going to win MVP probably. You can't you can't sit there and watch that game and tell me. That guy Brady's better than that guy right there. I don't. Right. I don't care. That's where it's, it's wrong with the MVP conversation right now. A little bit in football, we just oh, who's the quarterback on the best team? Oh, okay, he wins MVP, and I get it. Like I understand it, and Brady deserves it from that way. I don't want a, the guidelines to be broken just this year out of nowhere. But come on, I mean, you said it. Everybody's been hearing me say it for the last five, six weeks because it's the Josh Allen show. That's what it is up in Buffalo. They were the Buccaneers completely. And the first half stats where we show they're kind of underwhelming for Allen, it doesn't matter. You could call God, the Incredible Hulk, you know, I don't care, Jesus, whoever else you want to call, Superman, that wasn't going to change. They had no chance. I mean, the Buccaneers' defense overwhelmed the offensive line for the Buffalo Bills. There was nothing there to be had. And then the, uh, the same thing on the other side of the ball, Ahmed. I mean, the Bucks' offense 
overwhelmed the the Bills defense in, in every area. You know, the Bills again, they're not real big, right? So they really get compromised when they oh, it's a big offensive line like Tampa has. It's Leonard Fournette. And then that therefore they have to put too many people into, whoa, we gotta get around the line of scrimmage and try to stop that because we don't have enough big people that can kind of just hold their ground. So we need a lot of people up there to just shoot gaps and do that. And Tampa just absolutely did whatever they wanted against Buffalo in the first half. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, hey, this, you know what happens in the second half? One team starts to get a little conservative, right? The, the pass rush, this is one thing you see in the NFL, and this is where depth of pass rush really matters in football, especially in a game where you get up a little bit against a great quarterback. They die out as the game goes on. So they lost their ability to go 4-4, four, 4-5 four, four, around the edge all game long because, damn it, how many times can you rush the passer before you start to lose gas, let alone you're chasing this guy all over the field too so they die out and that plays into the bills and josh allen's hands and they mount this furious comeback with him with just you know first off hey great throws great job getting out of sacks and then his running ability again it's is as good as anybody in football not named lamar jackson or kyler murray after that josh allen's the best running quarterback in football he's a freak show absolute freak show um you know, yeah, I, I feel for him because it's a lot on him right now. I really do. Uh, but to me, I think the big thing what I would say is the Buccaneers, You, the, this is why them or the Cardinals are the best team in football. You could just you, – you, we saw in the first half what they are when they're playing their best. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to stop. It really is. The offense has everything. I mean everything. We know it has weapons. Now you got Brady to get you in the right play if something messes up. The scheme gives you delivers you everything, right? I mean, the think scheme's about getting it. better. You like I, do you this, think? I do. Yeah, the scheme is 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 a great scheme because they really have a little of everything. I mean, how many weeks have we come in here and one week it's he throws every play. This week they did it through the run. Yesterday you heard me yelling in the first half. How many f screen passes do they have? I mean, it was tight end screen, receiver screen, receiver screen, tight end screen, which was great against the Bills who were putting all these people at the line of scrimmage. You get the ball out there, you know, you get some people, and all of a sudden you got your receiver on the edge with limited people because they're so packed in there to stop the run, right? So they have answers, a playbook for everything, the talent to go along with it. And I just think, yeah, of course, when they're playing their best, um, they're arguably the best team in football. But I do want to give Buffalo a lot of credit for hanging in there and staying in there. I, I really think, listen, in a lot of ways, sometimes in the modern-day NFL, when you're playing a quarterback like Josh Allen, mm -hmm. right, and you get up like 24 nothing or 24-3, it's almost a bad thing. Like, I feel like the Bucks would have won more convincingly if the Bills kind of hung around a little early on for the game. And then the Bucks would have just worn them down and won the football game. But you take your foot off the gas pedal – you become a little shy with, I don't want to call this play an offense. It's, let's not give them a chance to make a play or do something. I don't want to call this defense and let Josh Allen just one play 80-yard touchdown to Diggs, right? So you start to be a little conservative and manage the game, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, they're rolling now, and we can't really reaccelerate or step on the gas here to get going again. Yeah, Coach, how do we stop a rolling Josh Allen? Exactly, and you that's can't. what happens. Why do we do this? Yeah, well, and that's Why what happens. Happen? But I feel like you know, this year we've seen games like this a lot, where we go, "This team's up twenty points, and here yeah. we are. What? It's four minutes left in the game, and it's coming down to the very end." And I think you know, the way I explained it is kind of what happens a little bit. So where does this leave the Bills now? Because the, the playoff Ooh. odds, I think we have them week by week here. I know. And Damn, I'm rooting for the Bills. Entering week 13 to make the playoffs was 88%. They had a better than 50% chance to win the AFC East. Now they're 7-6. and six. They still have a better than not chance to make the playoffs, 66%. Yeah. But their chance to win the AFC East is down to 22%. But they're a bubble team now. I mean, they, they are a and bubble that's where team. that's they're going to be. And they don't have a lot of great – they've been in some good games. They don't have a lot of great wins. You think they're – you think they're a bubble team? I think they're a bubble Legit team. Bubble they're team. a wild card team. I would be surprised if they beat New England in a few weeks. But the one thing they got going for them, and listen, I think they're a playoff team, and I think they are one of the seven best teams in the AFC, and I also think they'll be dangerous in the playoffs with certain matchups. They will. You know, they're, 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 their defense is still good, and it matches up with some offenses in, in the AFC really well, like we've talked about. It's the kind of the big overpowering offense that they've had to deal with, right, in their – last four weeks of games they've had the Colts the Patriots and the Bucks mm -hmm. and that's 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 a tough matchup for them it is but 
The fact that they got the Panthers, the Patriots, the Falcons, the Jets, I'm not going to sit here and just go, oh, yeah, these are wins. But you know but I, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. to me, it looks like a 3-1 and one finish. That should happen in Buffalo. You know, we'll see how Josh Allen's ankle is. It's hard, though. Yeah. You know, this is what I tried to say to people six, seven weeks ago. It's hard to just go, wait, one side of the ball is just one guy doing amazing things with Stefan Diggs, and then there's not really a whole lot else that makes a defense go, oh, no, we got to worry about this guy or this part of the scheme. There's nothing there, and that's where Josh Allen is absolutely amazing. I'm going to still say they make the playoffs, Amon. I am. I've been saying all along I thought it would be – right now we got New England, Tennessee, Kansas City, Baltimore, Chargers, Colts, Buffalo. I really thought this would be the seven, except I thought the Chargers – I thought the Chargers would supplant the uh, – I mean, the Colts would supplant the Chargers, and we might see Cleveland in there at one point. And I'm not giving up on Cleveland yet either, but uh, either way, I like the seven teams that are in right now. There are five, seven, and six teams in the AFC. Buffalo is the seven seed. They're one of those five teams. Also one of those five teams, yeah. the Cincinnati Bengals, Boom. who go down in overtime. Another one of those furious comebacks. Looks yeah. like the 49ers are going to roll to a somewhat easy victory. But then here come Joe Burrow. Here comes Jamar Chase. Two late touchdowns. They they force overtime. Uh, both these teams, the 49ers and Bengals, I want them in the playoffs. I do too. I think they're fun teams to watch. They're playoff teams. Yeah. I think they're fun teams to watch. Right. Let's start with a team that won here, though, because they got a tight end who's playing as well as a playmaker, as any playmaker in the NFL right now. George Kittle's gone over 150 yards the last two games. He, When he is like this, I mean, are there many other players in the league who are as unstoppable as George Kittle? And then you got Debo, Samuel. And so it's like you do have multiple playmakers and a good defense for the 49ers. Why can't they be? Well, that's why I'm with you. That's why their health is paramount. Like, I think Debo, he must have, as the game went on yesterday, I felt like we saw him less and less. I wonder if his groin acted up a little bit or they were being careful with him. But, you know, Kittle's special to what you're talking about. There's no doubt. I mean, come on. It's one of the most physically gifted tight ends in football, if not at the very top. You know, he's great blocker. And then what's the big thing that, you know, accentuates it even more, right? I mean, we talked about it a little last night. I know I'm putting you on the spot. It's Shanahan. Shanahan's ability to get his stars the ball, to me, is second to none. It's just amazing. Oh, Kittle's not in here? We'll f- find the 90 ways to give Debo Samuel the ball. Oh, Debo's out the last two weeks? We'll find 90 ways to get Kittle the ball. Right, I mean that's that's Debo didn't play in Seattle last week. Of course, he didn't practice much this week. He was kind of a game time decision. But yeah, that coupled with you know Shanahan and you have to defend the run. He just plays them so well off of each other. And then Kittle, of course, even in the drop back pass game is really good. This game was even. I looked at these two teams as the day went on, and I went really. These teams are very even. Yes, I really looked at it that way. It's just one team made some crucial mistakes, really, that kind of swayed the game to a twenty-six to favor, twenty-six, uh, twenty to six favor for the 49ers. And of course, that was the muff punts. You know, the two buff punts by Phillips yes. cost the Bengals 10 points, gave short fields to the 49ers. And that, to me, was the biggest difference in the game. But I looked at it as being very even, certainly. And it's the second week in a row where hey, the Bengals have just messed up a little bit in, in some big moments. And that's why they lost the Chargers, why they lost yesterday. I do want to give Garoppolo some credit. You know, he's, he's playing. Last week he had two bad interceptions. They haven't had a great run game the last two weeks. He played pretty good yesterday. Mm-hmm. He made a lot of tight throws in the middle of the field and even made one or two big throws outside the numbers, which you never see. Um, but either way, I, I, I think, yes, I'm with you in the fact that if either one of these teams get in, like, I don't, I'm not picking it, but would I go, oh, my gosh, the Bengals and the 49ers got to the NFC or AFC championship game? I don't think it's a crazy thought. You know, again, the, the Niners defense is a top 10 defense. Bengals are in the top half of the league, and we know they both have explosive offensive playmakers. Um, it was a fun game to watch. It really was. Yeah, 49ers right now are the sixth seed in the NFC at 7-6. and six. They're full game up on a bunch of 6-7 and seven teams in the NFC. And I remember it was just like three or four weeks ago, there was a debate and a conversation on 49ers Twitter about, you know, should we just play Trey Lance? Is this season a lost cause? Yeah, Do no. we just play Trey no. Lance and build for the future? Uh, the future is now in San Francisco, That's and they're right. a playoff team, and they look like they could give a whole lot of teams a whole lot of problems. Uh, 
The Bengals could do that too if yes. they get in. And there were those two late touchdowns. We got Joe Burrow in the first half, Joe Burrow in the second half. Yeah. You know, Cincinnati actually outgained the 49ers right. in the first half of this game. You right. mentioned the two muff punts. They also had Cincinnati 11 play drive and a 12 play drive in the first half. Both of those ended in field goals, yep. so they were not scoring touchdowns. Yep. So they were pretty able to uh, consistently move the ball. Uh, whether it be through the air with with Joe Burrow or just through field position, yeah. Uh, but in the second half, he goes off, and this is why you liked him coming out. It just seems like he doesn't have the strongest arm, but he's got this certain ability and this moxie and this leadership yeah. and this edge to bring his team back. Like you never count out Joe Burrow, no doubt. Well, their offense has everything. That's that's the one thing. So they can they can kind of adjust to whatever it is. Oh wait, they're playing this. So let's go to this part of our playbook. You know, I really like their offense. Yeah, they can run the ball. They have boots and play actions. They have a very good drop back pass game, and they know how to dial up a shot down the field every now and then. And he's an aggressive thinker and thrower, Burrow. So that, and the second half, you know, you heard me yelling a little bit yesterday. I'm going, I don't even know the names of the 49ers corners. Would we throw outside there? And they started to do that a little bit more. He found T. Higgins over the middle for a bunch of big plays. But, yeah, they hung in there. And I was worried about whether Burrow might, you know, get hit too much, which bordered on that for, at times in the game. Uh, but, yeah, his arm has gotten stronger. He's got incredible feel. I love watching Joe Burrow. I really do. I think he's an amazing quarterback. He's a, he's already a superstar in my mind. And yeah, he just hangs in there. And again, he's that guy that he's that guy again that has that gift because everybody sees what he does on a daily basis to where you know, I know we've we've hit this before. When you have that kind of quarterback, the team is always their chest can be puffed out. Oh, we're going to win today. We got that guy. You know, we're down 20 to 6. Mm-hmm. No big deal. Let's keep playing. We got that guy. And that's what Burrow does, and he's Joe Cool that way. Um, just yes, they they're they're a young team again. They're still getting used to being good, battle tested, and we've seen in a few games this year they've messed it up. You know, I would say last week they messed it up. Yesterday they messed it up to a degree. I'm not saying they would have won the Bears game earlier this year. You know, and uh, I think they're getting used to kind of being one of those teams that's a little bit marked because of their talent. But good win for the 49ers nonetheless. And I'm with you. I think they're both playoff teams. Yeah, I, I really I, do. The question is, how is Cincinnati going to get in here, right? Because they're currently yeah. the nine seed. They got Cleveland ahead of them on tie breaks right now. But who knows? Perhaps it's going to be the Baltimore Ravens that what, drop it, out. Oh, oh, I know. Well, forget well, it. It's okay. What? No. Well, I added. Like, I can't I, forget I, it. Now. You say punts. that now. You the said, muff yeah. punts, okay, and I do want to do this. I want okay. to make sure I get this, all Let's right? Let's get this in. Because I had a per- no, I had a perfect segue. It was going to be a thing of beauty. It was a, a thing of beauty. Pete knows it. We all know it. It was, it was there, but we do want to get in this last point. I know. It's probably not even that good either. <laughs> Ten to six. Uh-huh. Muff okay. a punt. Going to get off the field. Ball's rolling. Now it's third down. They're going to get off the field. Ball's rolling around. Von Bell picks the ball up. It's an incomplete pass. And he's running, and he's kind of joking, and he points at a guy. They give him a taunting penalty. Mm. They give the 49ers the ball. They score the touchdown a few plays later. He throws a touchdown pass to George Kittle. That, to me, was the turning point, key point of the game. At the very least, they should have been down 13-6 to there with the ball and some time to maybe go get their own field goal. And, again, modern-day NFL, I mean, come on, you you got to know you can't point at somebody's face at this point. Come on, yeah. it's week 14, and I like Von, Von Bell. All right, now I'm really sorry. Start your amazing segue once again. No, Speaking it, of the Baltimore Ravens. When there's, a ch- when there's a chance to talk about the taunting penalties, we do have to do that. And, and, and it was a major official. point. I'm sorry. A major, a it was a major point. point. I'm sorry, and I did not mean to cut you off because you're the master of the segment. All right, now we got to make a hard right turn. All right, let's change the subject completely <laughs> to uh, the Baltimore Ravens here. No, they're connected because you got the, the Bengals in it with the Browns, and you got the Ravens there too. And this was another one of those games where uh-huh. it was it, you didn't know what was going to happen. Um, you, know, you thought you did with the Cleveland Browns with a big lead, but then Baltimore comes back without Lamar Jackson, yep. which we'll talk about. But there are a couple things that happened in this game that got Chris out of his seat and angry once again. It's not just the officials that can do that to Chris. It can also be coaches, play calling, and sometimes what he says is too aggressive, yeah. play calling. And so Set it up here. Which one? I want to know which one were you more mad about? Were you more mad about John Harbaugh going for two down 15 once they scored that touchdown um, to make it a a nine point game, right? Right. Or were you more mad by the Cleveland Browns defense when they're playing uh, on that fourth down late in the game when they converted at the thirty yard catch to 
uh, well, who was it? Uh, yeah, Bateman. Bateman. Yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. You're down two scores. Which one made you more mad? Bleed the f- <laughs> clock. <laughs> now you're going to go, hey, he take a shot and get 30 yards right here so you can maybe score a touchdown and kick the onside kick and maybe beat us. I mean, Cleveland and defense, I just don't know what to say. They're all over the place. They both made you mad. But the two-point think... conversion probably made me mad. Okay, so let's get into that. Yeah. So they were down they, they're down 15. You're going to need a two-point conversion at some point. 24 to 9, right. 24 to point. 9. Right. So then they, they score a right. the touchdown. Hurry up the middle. And then so you're like, all right, we're down 9. Right. And there's about, what, eight minutes left in the game? 8.56 left when so they scored figure, that. All right, right. Well, we're going to go for two at some point. Whether right. it's this touchdown or next touchdown, right. he elects to go for two yeah. right then. Right. So before you say anything, yeah. they didn't get it, by the way. Yeah. Before you say anything, let's hear John Harbaugh I give hear his this. answer why he did that. Right, well, it's pretty much a standard uh, kind of really not a non-decision. You do it at that point in time because you're going to have to you're going to have to get win a two-point conversion. So you understand if you get it or don't get it early where you're at going from there, how many possessions you're going to need and what you're going to have to do. If you wait till the last two-point conversion and you don't get it, the game's over. You've lost. So you, you try it early. We're in a seven-point game and we know where we stand. Uh, we don't get it. We're in a nine-point game and we know that we need two possessions. I don't like this. So what I was, you know where you stand too if you get the two point conversion. That's where that's where we gloss over that. If no, you get the two point, yeah. if you don't get the two, if you get the two point conver- or, or just kick the extra point, you know where you stand still. So you can't say that because right. you, you're down no, by no, eight. No, no, he and can't you need say a touchdown that. No, he can't say that because because what he's saying is that if you kick right there and yeah. you're down by eight and then you score right with thirty seconds to go in the game or whatever and you go for two and miss it, crap. Game's over. You right. don't you don't have any time now okay. to do an onside kick and to and so if you know earlier that you're gonna need to score and then kick a, a field goal, then you're gonna try to score as quickly as you can, knowing that you need as much time still on the clock to get another possession and go. But kick they're gonna a field score goal. as quickly as they can when they're down by eight. Not like, necessarily, because you don't necessarily want to leave time on the clock for Cleveland to go down. Okay, and All score right. at the end of the game. See, to me, there's still too much predicting of the future there. Yeah. Like, you're, like you know how it's going to unfold, and that's. But you it. do know you need a two point at some point. Oh, I, right? I got you. I got you. But to me, but what I will always go back to is where, and again, Cleveland dropped the ball. We know that, and again, Baltimore got a chance. But I'm always a believer in make the game a one score game. That makes the other team feel the pressure of the one score game and change the way they call the game, right? That's now, your that's your big point, is that, that you think you would rather play the Cleveland Browns and have them only be up eight points right. than them to have the comfort of being up nine nine, points. nine To me, again, the, a really good offensive coordinator or a team, and again, I'm not putting Stefanski in that category quite yet, okay? Mm-hmm. You know that. Like, they would go... Shanahan and McVay and McDaniels, they'd go, we're up two scores. You know, first down, I might go play action pass here. Let's just, let's, let's get a big chunk of yards, get a first down. You take the pressure off of them of going, oh man, they're only down one score. We want to take some time off the clock. We don't want to do anything that way and, 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 you know, you know, mess up the game and give them a chance. Let's just be conservative. You, in my opinion, you take pressure off the team now that's up by nine. You give them a little bit more leeway to be aggressive, maybe draw up a play or do something that they are not going to do if it's a one-score game because they're going to be worried about making that mistake. That would be my assessment and being around the NFL a little bit and that pressure there. To me, yes, now again. But can't you see the opposite, though? Can't you see a team being up two scores playing very conservative as well? Just being like, all right, we're up two scores. Let's not do anything to mess this up. And I think ultimately you I, want I, I the other team to play that conservative. That side of it. I, get, I guess there is that side of it. Yes, I mean, there is. I, I guess I just think there's more value in making the other team continue to manage the game under the pressure of the one-score game over the fact that now it's a two-score game. And, hey, yeah, we, we, we got a little leeway. Now, again, I know it didn't work out that way, but to me, the way they did it, you know, again – a whole bunch of other things percentage wise have to happen that you can't even like, I don't know. You can't quantify in my opinion. You don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty. And I think a lot of this too in in analytics is really on the edges. It's we're talking three, four, 5% here. Yeah. John's talking about knowing beforehand a little bit sooner uh, what you have to do at the end of a game. And so, I mean, I get all that stuff and throughout this whole conversation too, uh, oftentimes we don't talk about the fact that they could have gotten the two point conversion there, and that would have been a boost to them because then they're down seven. Then you know you only need a extra point to tie, or who, who knows, maybe you can try to win it at the end of regulation. So I think 
you know, th- there's a loss of version too uh, to the fan. It's like we always talk about it when it doesn't work, and I think sometimes when it does work, we're just like, oh, all right, they got lucky. It worked out there. Um, where the, you feel the pain, you feel the pain of right. not getting the fourth down or the two point conversion more than you feel the joy of actually getting it, which is, I think, why we talk about it and question it. So no, much. I know. You know, I, I, there, there's, there's more I want to say here, but there's so much to. to there's kind a lot of in this game, so I think, yeah. that, I think that's reasonable. That's I think it's reasonable. I do. I don't like though the of you know what you need to get again. So, so you're down by eight, right? Okay, so wait, but Cleveland goes three and out. Right. Are they going to try to score as quickly as are the Ravens going to try to score as quickly as they can if they're I don't know but they eight. got the ball back they got the ball with 720 left. Yeah. So you you're looking still you're going to get two possessions. No, that's true. Right, you're going to have two possessions. I mean, if you score a touchdown and miss it, you're still going to have another and you don't get the two point coverage, you're still going to have another chance to get the ball. I know that's where I don't like it, I guess. That's where I, I, I look at it that way. Um, but I guess it's an industry discussion. I guess the numbers don't necessarily agree with me that way either. Uh, so the main point is that yeah. you want all the information is early, and if you if you if you know that you got to go for you know two at some point, might as well go for it early and just figure it out from I, there I, on I, out. So I, that, that's their, I guess that's so. their philosophy. I guess their philosophy. Now right. what they have to figure out right. is is life after Lamar. We don't know. We're going to know at some point today. You might know when you're listening to this podcast. Yeah, right. The severity of the injury it wasn't great that he had to get carted off the field. Um, maybe that was just more of a precaution. precaution. I think so. Tyler Huntley comes in. He looks okay. Yeah. Right. Did I mean, really obviously they came back yeah. and, and almost won this game, but you know, we don't know. So it's hard to say, but without just, let's just say they don't have him or he's not a hundred percent for a, a week or two. How much does that hurt their playoff chances? They're eight and five right now in the four seed. Yeah. I, I mean, Baltimore is. You know, I, I know you and I have had a discussion where we've talked. I, I I don't really know how good they are. I don't even with Lamar. Even with Lamar, they're they're tough. You know, I know they're going to fight. Their game planning is real good on both sides of the ball. But yeah, it certainly hurts their chances if there's no Lamar here over the next few weeks. And again, Tyler Hundley did some really good things. There's no doubt about that. You know, made some great throws. You know, I think a little bit they got Baltimore in a position where we just talked about with Tampa. I mean, the Browns in a position we just talked about with Tampa where it's like, whoa, we're winning. Wait, we got to take – let's take our foot off the gas pedal. a little. Let's be a little conservative, see if we can get them to bleed, bleed the clock. And all of a sudden it's hard to reaccelerate once again. But, uh, I mean, they got the Packers, the Bengals, the Rams, the Steelers. Tyler Hundley's good. He's not Lamar Jackson, though. He's not. And Lamar hasn't been playing his best. I understand that. And I think they need him more now than ever because, yeah, the Packers and Bengals and Rams are going to be able to move the ball in that defense. You need his playmaking ability. And to me, that's where, you know, again, you, you heard me say this last night. The Ravens are a running football team. You know, they can pass the ball and be dangerous and beat you that way, but they're not running the ball the way they're capable of running the ball, what we've seen the last three or four years. And – you know, they're not built to be able to just carve you up in the past game. That's not what they are. You know, you, you did you like my analogy I used last night when I was like – What was it? Well, I was like, well, why don't the Chiefs just dominate in the run game? Why don't the Chiefs just – the offense isn't working. Why don't they just dominate? The pass game's not working. How come they're not one of the best run teams and they just can't take over that way? Why? Because they're built to throw the ball. You can't just change and do that. So the Ravens are, yeah, in a tough spot there. They're not necessarily built to throw the ball. They're better than in years past. Um but yeah, I do think they're they're going to be hurt without Lamar. I do. You know, I don't think Tyler Huntley he's good. I don't think he's been able to consistently make plays, throws, uh, score touchdowns the way Lamar Jackson can. Worst case scenario, yeah, we don't know right now. Right. Worst case scenario, he's out for the rest of the year. Lamar. Right. Does Baltimore make the playoffs? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. Um, you know, again, I'm I'm not a believer in Baltimore. I think you've kind of heard me say that yeah. all year long. They got a little bit of a cushion, but not that much of a not cushion. Not that much. Not with this a schedule. Seven, a lot too. of seven win teams out there. Yeah, not with this schedule. And then you got you know Green Bay at home, who we know is real good. And the Bengals, who already put a butt whooping on them. Mm-hmm. You know, the Rams at home, who are going to score points too. You know, those, I I think those are going to be games where yeah, you're not going to be able to sit there and go, wait, we're going to steal. We might be able to win this twenty to seventeen. I don't think so. Uh, I think those are games where you're going to probably have to score 28, maybe 30, and at least two or three of them. And uh, that's where I think they miss Lamar. And the Steelers, they're 6-6-1, six, six, and one, even though you've written them off. No chance. And you've said no chance. No, that was do- another game, same thing, like in that game. Same type of game. I mean, it's just oh, we're, we're dominating, we're whooping their ass. 
let's whoa, let's back off a little bit, try to bleed the clock, and all mm-hmm. of a sudden, you know, oh, we made a mistake or two, and all of a sudden, shit, we're they're driving down the sc- the field to the score. Yeah. But um, I and Chris look- and Chris is going. Do you know I have to kiss feet if the Steelers make the playoffs? Vikings, do you realize? that? I know, like step your game up. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, some of that that those the some of the decisions, the yeah. clock management, all were issues in that one. I, I'll say this just to end up the the end the NFC AFC North conversation. I still think the Bengals and the Browns are the two most physically talented teams in the division at this point. I mm. do. I think they're the two best teams when they play their best football. You know, again, they're just not as battle tested mm. and as maybe polished as overall the Ravens roster, are. Though. Overall, overall roster, though. Overall roster. Wow. I like those two rosters the most. And if they can just get out of their way and not mess things up a little bit, I think they're both playoff quality football teams. Well, you got you got a couple real good players on the defensive side that stood out. On Sunday, one was Miles Garrett with a strip sack, fumble recovery, touchdown uh, on Tyler Huntley. You also had a guy by the name of Micah Parsons who had a huge game, and that gets us to Cowboys against Washington, another game that the Cowboys looked like they were easily going to win, but Washington did come back. This one comes from Super Santos 22. He says, some call him the defensive rookie of the year, some call him the defensive player of the year, but we say damn okay. Micah I like Parsons. It. That's great. Super um, Santos, 22. And, and we had this debate because points bet has it right now as Micah Parsons and Miles Garrett neck and neck for the defensive player right. of the year with TJ Watt, the guy that actually leads in sacks right, right. now, right. is is uh, number three. But you, lo- you give the edge to Micah Parsons right I, now. I would. I would. I mean, you know, again, I'm not trying to point – pat myself on the back but I I feel like as in the last three or four weeks I've been trying to say this a lot forget rookie defensive rookie of the year he's he's already won that send him the award that's over he's in the defensive player of the year MVP conversation in my opinion again there's just people don't do what he's doing oh whoa he's look at this guy play middle linebacker he's one of the best middle linebackers in football look at him run around the field fill holes sideline to sideline Hey, uh, we got some injuries to DN. Can you go to DN? Oh, whoa, holy shit. He, one of the best pass rushers in football. Can't block him one-on-one. Can set the edge in the run game. Mm-hmm. I mean, creates pressure all the time. The fact that they felt okay doing that to a rookie who might be overwhelmed. You know, rookies are you yeah. know, overwhelmed uh-huh. perhaps first time in the NFL. Right. And he didn't even <laughs> play his last year at Penn State, right? No, I mean, so he, he has sat a, out because of COVID. So it's right. like he didn't play last year. Right. He's a rookie. To have the faith to move him around, I mean, that's abnormal that they would give that abnormal. faith to a, to a rookie, I, right? I think it's a great point by you. It is because it just is the mental, you know, gymnastics of, again, I know it's defense and a lot of people just think, well, they just got to go get the football. No, they got rules and things they got to do and think about. And his ability to be instinctive but also know the rules. And you really, you saw it a little bit in the training uh, hard knocks on HBO. He was, I mean, really into – the X's and O's and what you should do that way. But, yeah, I think it speaks to really what you see with great players, you know, 99 out of 100 times, yes, they're physically extremely gifted, but most of them have a mental aspect that's special too. As much as we think Deion Sanders and Randy Moss were just out there, just, whoa, they're faster. Like, Randy Moss is one of the smartest football people I was ever around in the NFL. Deion Sanders is the same type of thing from people I've talked to. They understand what the other team's trying to do. They study their opponents, whether it's, you know, understanding a DB and how he covers or a receiver and how he runs routes. And Michael Parsons looks like he has that total package. And you heard me say last night, to me, he's like, I haven't seen anybody with this type of skill set. I'm not going to say he's him yet, but I have not seen anybody with this type of skill set since Lawrence Taylor. I just will say that. Where you could just go, whoa, we can play him off the ball and he's amazing. And we can play him at the end of the line of scrimmage, and he can whoop the crap out of offensive tackles. That's where it's rare. And right now, he leading the charge, and the Dallas defense is playing ball right now. And they're healthy. And to me, they've jumped out more than anything the last two weeks. You know, even though I know the offense is a few plays, the offense is somewhat eh as of late and uh, doesn't seem to have a great rhythm about it. Yeah, I want to get into that offense here in a yeah. second, but do you want to tell people about points bet and how they can get some some free money here too with maybe 125 bucks that they can just give? Well, I mean, I don't know. When I hear free money, I'm, yeah. I'm in. Uh, oh, you get free money? Yes, sign me up, please. <laughs> and okay? then I go, wait, nothing's free. Wait, what's going on here? Yeah, but this, but is, this actually, is actually free. Pretty free. It's actually free. There's no doubt. 
All right. And if you're in an eligible state, Points Bet has an exclusive sign up offer for unbuttoned listeners that you can't miss. All right. You listen to this podcast yep. and you get a can't miss offer. All right. Download the Points Bet app. Use code UNBUTTON to sign up. Bet $1 on any NFL game and get 125 in free bets if a point is scored. So if a point is scored, you don't even need to pick the winner. You, you bet a buck. You go. The, I think as long point, as you don't pick like the Texans, <laughs> some points gonna get scored. The, uh, whoever or, they're playing, though, yeah. they're gonna score. They're gonna points. score. You're right. So it's like You're it right. doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. So all right, they, you like that? Ahmed explained it. I explained it. <laughs> and now listen to this. Don't just bet this football season. Live your bet life with points bet. All right, you got it. Yeah. Download the app. Unbuttoned, free money. If you've done that, hey, if you've done that, let us know. Yeah, you know, because if you haven't done it and you're in an eligible state, we're gonna say you're throwing away money, and we don't condone that on How the many unbuttoned. States pod. are eligible and not eligible at this point. Points Where are we getting at? We gotta in, be getting think up there, in, right? Yeah, Pete. Do you know? I think they're in like. 10 states maybe yeah. right now uh, is that, is that uh, how many states have actually legalized gambling at well this it depends point? you know some may be you know legal for some some may be you know i know you got to get i don't know i know I, some I don't states know are works. on it and some aren't i tried to talk like i knew there for a second but i really you did no you idea. act like you're like some states gotta get on it <laughs> some states don't gotta get like, on it <laughs> <laughs> I was like, these words are not helping anyone right now. I'm just saying. Them. Well, that was a good job by you trying to be like NBC sportscaster. Yeah, I was like, what right am I there? talking about? I was like, I don't know any of this stuff. All right, so go go get on that. And if you've done it, let us know. Yeah, I'd like to know too. No and doubt. Let us know what you're doing with 125 bucks and free bets, right. and then see if we can win some games there. Yep. Uh, maybe Chris had a very good week this week, so hopefully you listened to him. Yep. Uh, the defense is awesome for the for the Dallas Cowboys. I yeah. mean, you got Gregory back. You got Ooh. you got what? Lawrence, Demarcus Lawrence, Lawrence back, back right. too. I mean, that's as healthy as they've been all year. It looks defense. awesome, right? And so you're like, wow, this is great because the Cowboys. We know they have a great offense. Yeah. What? What? Wait a second. Hold on. Yeah. What's happening to the offense? Right. And, and like specifically, what's happening to Dak Prescott? Because I don't know if he doesn't isn't healthy. There's some chatter out of beat reporters that cover the team that there's something going on here with Dak. He doesn't look right. And the offense doesn't look right. No. And are you concerned? I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't want to say it. I mean, to a degree. I'm not concerned in the fact of where I go, oh, man, I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs. That's yeah. not a question for me. But but to be that Super Bowl team, you're like, you were like a few weeks ago, exactly like, they can right. win the Super Bowl. Exactly right. They're, they're not the well-oiled machine I would have thought maybe right after, you know, they – beat the Patriots, and then beat the Vikings without Dak Prescott, right, where I just went, damn. I mean, they're just, right? It's, it's kind of gone downhill ever since. Dak Prescott's certainly not been the same. I, I would think there is something still nagging him, bothering him. He's missed way too many throws, even yesterday, where I just go, man, this isn't the guy that I saw before the injury who couldn't do no wrong, was as hot as anybody in football, was, was on the way to being in the MVP discussion, really for how explosive and unstoppable the offense was. You know, I think there's two things that jump out to me. Him being a little off, and I think I've said this maybe last week or the week before, their run game not quite as dominant, right? And they've had some injuries on the offensive side of the ball too, so I don't want to downplay that. That's yeah. a real thing. They're player-centric in Dallas. They've, they've acquired a bunch of Jimmys and Joes who are just absolute freaks of nature, so they're a little dependent on that. But, you know, I think early in the year – for the most part, they were able to run the ball well enough all the time that teams had to play. Oh, we gotta we gotta respect that to a degree. We gotta slow that down, and that you know healthy receivers led to just a fireworks show in the pass game. They could do whatever they want, but now the run game has slowed down. In my I mean, in my opinion, and yeah, I think Pollard the hurt. And yeah, Zeke, Pollard and Zeke's been came banged out of the game. up. Yeah. Right, he's been dealing with a knee issue. He looked better yesterday. Um, but I don't think it's the kind of run game where teams are sitting there going, oh, my gosh, like we're going to get killed by this group here today. And now that's put a little bit more pressure on the pass game. Cooper's just getting back healthy. Like we talked about, Dak Prescott is off a little bit. And, you know, when I do watch their passing game, hey, it's good. I don't sit there and go, oh, wow, this is so creative. Look what they're doing here. They're a little bit like, hey, they got all the plays, and they just call him, and they go, oh, he's good, our receivers are good, and it'll work. I don't know if I necessarily look at it and go, oh, well, it's really tied well together, right? They had a rhyme and a reason for everything and a, yeah. a zig for every zag to keep you on balance. And, oh, wait, it's this run. Oh, no, it's the play, auction, play action off of it. You know, they don't tie to plays together that way um, in the same fashion. And to me, as the great offensive coordinators in football, and to me, that's where they've dropped off a little bit. It didn't matter 
the first five or six weeks because they ran the ball so well, too, to where they just got looks where it was like, what pass play did you call? Oh, okay, <laughs> he's open. Woo, yeah, because they were really rolling in every aspect. But now because the run game slowed down a little bit, and I think, again, we're in the time, time of the year where teams got a good feel for what you like to do in the pass game that, yeah, they're – they're not able to just be that well-oiled machine that they were, you know, first five, six weeks of the year. Yeah, Paul Good tweeted us. He lives over in the U.K., and he said that we seem to have the Cowboys rammed down our throats here in the U.K. a yeah. lot. Well, welcome to America. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so do we. We, we do, too. It's yeah. America's team, and it's, you can never <laughs> turn on a TV where whatever talk show it is, the Cowboys are going to get, uh-huh. you know, some amount of time. But uh, I think at the end of the day, still, you know, they're 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 pretty well coached on both sides of the ball, right? You know, they had control of that game yesterday. They did. I don't know what the hell they were doing on the interception, Dak, the last interception. I mean, both yeah. of his interceptions were bad yesterday. Could have had a couple more. Too. He probably could have had a couple more. Exactly right. Had some that were kind of bumping around and bobbling around. They dropped one or two, but that last one was really bad and one where you just don't expect him to make that mistake. Understand the game a little bit. You're up twenty-seven to fourteen at that point. The other team's quarterback is hurt. Don't give them any, you know, advantage or momentum here. And so they run a bootleg to the right. There's a guy, you know, 55, Holcomb, right? That's him sitting there in the hole. And I don't know why, but the tight end also pulled up where he sh- – I've never seen that where the tight end pulls up on a, a drag route or a crossing route on a bootleg. He always has to run. He slows down. Dak still tried to throw him the ball. And, of course, that became a disaster, and all of a sudden we were in a football game there and got a little scary for a minute. But they got the win, Yep, and they probably won the, the NFC The defense East was absolutely defense overwhelming all, it's, early, it's, right? It's a great unit. That's it's where we got to make right sure now. we paint that we picture. I think we okay, did. We, we did. did. I thought Washington – They whooped that ass early on. I thought this game, I was like, all right, well, there goes Washington's hopes, and it, they are gone for a division title, which I guess were kind of there yeah. before this game, if they yeah. had won this game for sure. But they're still the seventh seed I in the NFC. That's I crazy. I mean, you can't – Right, them. I don't know about Heineke. What's going on with a knee? Yeah, Kyle Allen had to come in. That yeah. would change things. He took some big hits, Heineke, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're they're still just in it. the six and seven with Minnesota, Philadelphia, Atlanta, and New Orleans. That's going to be an interesting race there down the stretch. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know who's better out of that group, but San Francisco sitting pretty. And you heard me say this last night. I think the one team that really benefited from yesterday, they didn't even play, was the Rams. The way it shook out for the Rams yesterday, now sitting at eight and four. I mean, I know it's not done yet, but man, you know, it's they've you've given them some leeway if they lost another game or two yeah. to where you can almost go, yeah, they're going to be in the playoffs almost no matter what, unless they just have a total meltdown over the last they, month here. Yeah, if they can get a win tonight. Yeah, if they really get a win tonight, you can almost assure them in the playoffs. We're going to get into damn okay, but we want to let you know that we are supported by Under Armour. Just a reminder here, and just like us, Under Armour wants to give you an edge, Chris. Yes, they do, and they are focused on performing better and taking their game to the next level, just like me and Ahmed. Yeah, we go for, we go from here right up to here. Yeah, you know, it's like next one more level, level up. Ding. Sometimes two levels. Yeah. We'd like to go two ding, levels ding. up. Yeah, ding, ding. Yeah. Double ding. Right. Uh, everything from running shoes that propel you forward to hoop shoes that give you that insane grip. They even make hoodies that reflect energy. Yes, they do. Yeah. And we're not just about the end result, winning or glory. Under, Under Armour, Armour is about hard work, <laughs> the dedication, the cycle of training, competing, and recovering. We give you advantages but not shortcuts. The, the only, only way is through. through. Wow. wow. We've done it. Wow. We've done it. I stepped on your line one there. <laughs> no, A-. but A-. it was like practice for the last line. It was, it was like we were in unison with right. Under Armour earlier, right. which set us up for a good ending. Yeah, I know. It's it that one's like a you know, it's a weird one. It's a short <laughs> sentence, so I always want to read into the second one. <laughs> you're, there. you're like I've earned another sentence here, right? Should <laughs> I, I just read. do look two? How, well, just look how two. good did I read there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do it. Damn okay, presented by Under Armour. Damn. I'm okay. Damn. I'm okay. Yeah, no, I mean, yes. I'm okay. The legal gambleizing. Oh, baby. I am Chris Sims. I'm okay. Damn. Okay. Let's give our damn okay to Aaron Rodgers, your boy. Even with bad toe or anything, which he says got worse after the game. Yeah, so we'll, have to, like we'll keep our eye on that toe. Yeah. Uh, Rodgers improves to 23 and 5 versus Chicago. He still owns the Bears. <laughs> and now he has now seven games versus Chicago with four or more touchdown passes and zero interceptions. That's the most amazing. of any opponent for him. The Bears, by the way, their quarterbacks since at least 1950 have only eight such games versus anyone. 
It's amazing. And Rodgers has seven against them. versus Chicago. That is amazing. <laughs> so he does he does own them. It's it, kind it, of it ownership. Is, it is very true. And it, the score, you go, ah, oh, it's a blowout game. First half, highly entertaining. Highly. Justin Fields, give him some props. Definitely. He was making big plays for Chicago and for Green Bay with a pick six. <laughs> right, yeah. Yep. Uh, he was exciting, fun to watch, it just was. coming back from that rib injury. So I think a lot of good things. If you're a Chicago fan, you're like, okay, that was actually kind of entertaining yeah. first half. Right. And then if you're a Green Bay fan, you're like, all right, well, we eventually own the team that we own. Yeah. So I think both fan bases walk away feeling like, okay, it's hey, okay. <laughs> they, got, they got some things about their team in Chicago they should be excited about regardless. You know, they're not the healthiest on defense, but – Got a lot of staples in place for the future to go, okay, I like it. Got a few young offensive linemen. Of course, got a quarterback who's going to be a star. Mooney Robinson, you know, Jakeem Grant, right? Montgomery's a good running back. I'd like to see them add another running back to the mix to a degree. Defensively, you still got Roquan Smith. Khalil Mack will be back. You know, Johnson's a really good corner, as you could see last night, and some of the issues he gave Devontae Adams. So, yeah, you should be excited about the Bears. I mean, you shouldn't have expected that you were just going and win that game. It was awesome that they were up 24-14 to 14 at one point. You know, early on in the football game, I mean, I know we were sitting there watching it together. I mean, Green Bay was a little, I think, asleep at the wheel, thinking, hey, we're just, it's Chicago. We own them. We're going to beat them. Offensively, couldn't do anything. You know, you saw Rodgers holding the ball. Didn't look like anybody was open downfield and all the camera angles we had here at NBC. They got a little pressure on them. They did that, and they had some good game plan plays to kind of expose the Green Bay defense a little bit. And, yeah, really jumped out on them. Uh, interception, like you said, was a big play for Green Bay as far as, wait, it was 10-7. to 7. The, the Packers kind of put an ugly touchdown together. They threw a fourth down pass to Lazard, right, to make it 10-7. But you're going, oh, the Bears still kind of have the momentum. I like the way things are looking. Rasul Douglas gets the interception, and you go, oh, crap, there he goes. It's over. But it wasn't. It wasn't over. Great answer by Fields, right? I think you and I were really impressed by that. Yep. He hits uh, – who was that he hit? Demir, Demir Bird, Bird, right? 54-yard touchdown. Right, and I think you and I looked at each other and like, man, what an answer. Young kid, Lambeau Field, Sunday night football. He didn't even blink. Yep. He gets that, and uh, then they're 17-14. The yeah, and, and then you get the 97-yard punt return by Jakeem Grant here. Right. And there's a question that we got from Chris Voteman. Yeah. Hey, guys, we need to give some more love to special teams play. Mm. It's one-third of the game, and the Packers will F up their season in the playoffs. You're not winning against elite teams with the current special teams. Luckily, the Bears suck. So he wanted us to give credit to the special teams, Chris. And then he goes and, and also slam the Packers special <laughs> teams unit for being so bad. Yeah. I think they were at, I think Matt LaFleur was asked about special teams. Like, are you going to get fire your <laughs> special teams coach? And he was like, no, we're not doing that. But what do you, what do you make of the fact that if there's a weakness on the Packers, maybe part of it is special teams? Yeah. Well, we we overlooked that a lot. I will say that, you know, we, there, there's games where, you know, again, we don't really probably even emphasize when teams kind of mess up that department enough. Like, Hey, we just talked about the Bengals. They messed up the game, That's special true. teams, right? You know, there, there's a, there's two or three games every week where you kind of look at it that way um but you know i'm no i'm trying to think throughout the year special teams we they've know had they've had the Crosby's, field goal misses yeah, Crosby's right had some issues i'm trying to think if there was any i do think they had a game where they well they dropped a punt against the rams they muffed a punt there the rams also muffed a well, punt so right. they kind of made yeah. up for it um and i'm trying to think if there was anything else there that i'm i'm missing uh that happened like here more egregious than but, other teams but it's but. it's a point that he's, he's right in the fact that we probably need to keep track of it a little yeah. bit more but that was the first punt return for a touchdown this year that surprised both of us insane remember it was in the highlight sheet and you go is that true I, you said and it, i was like go, it doesn't seem true but it's written here on this sheet it's crazy so the first one of the our year. nbc research department caught the ball inside the five yard line Which you're not supposed to do you're not supposed to do runs to the right yep green bay loses contain and all of a sudden you're going oh my gosh i mean you're you're going wait it was 14 10 green bay Uh uh-huh chicago answers 17 14 green bay goes three and out they return the punt you're going but this maybe this is the night it's gonna be (laughs) like maybe chicago's got them but then oh aaron Rodgers comes back and he 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 slices and dices and you say he does as good a job as anyone feeling out the game yes like what do i need to do oh i need to score 45 i'll go score 45 i'll score 45 yeah and so that's what he did i think the bigger concern though is right. wh- what's going on with that toe yeah uh because he said it was worse right he's played through it maybe yeah. he'll continue to play through it he will i asked you if he should 
take a game or two off to get it healthy, and you say that's that's really not an option for them. No, it's not an option for them. You know, first off, they want that number one seed. You know, to have that week off, and then of course, you know, I I know this from talking to people up there. I think I've told you this a little bit. You know, off air and things is they have real belief in themselves at home, and I know they lost in the NFC Championship game last year to the Buccaneers and everything like that. I get it. I mean, again, the game was really close. That was a special Bucks team. There's no doubt, right? But you know, yeah, history tells us Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay in January is very tough to beat. It's a tough stadium. There is a home field advantage. There's a mystique about it. The weather's almost always at least very cold. Rodgers has an arm like an Allen or a Brady in New England. It just doesn't matter. And so he's going to feel like he's got the advantage over just about every quarterback that comes into town not named Tom Brady. He's going to go, okay. It doesn't matter, and I think they're going to continue to play for that. And, you know, toe – hey, I, I've had a broken pinky toe before. Okay. Annoying as hell. Bothers you, but it won't affect you really physically other than you're just going, oh, man. I mean, the play gets done. You go, God, man, my f- thing hurts. Gosh, damn. But you can you can play through it. Is that what it is, his pinky toe? It's, his, it's his pinky toe or the next toe in, I believe, okay. right? Uh it's the pinky. pinky. pinky it toe. is. Yeah. So do you call it a pinky toe? I is think it, you do. Is, is it I a pinky toe? I call it a pinky toe. I've never known any different. Pete, do you call it a pinky toe? You yeah, do. He okay. Does. Maybe okay. I, I, I just, what do you call it? I don't know. I thought the pinky was more the hand. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know you. Uh, you had a pinky on your foot too. Yeah. Well, I, guess I do. You do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you do. I do. Pete does. Apparently, you don't. You have you have four middle fingers a, and a big sm- toe. I have a small toe. My small toe. But Rogers, I want to go on your point, and I know I've said it before, but. He, to me, has the greatest feel in football for going, wait, our defense is good and they're not very good. I'm just going to be conservative and I'll get first downs and we'll win the game 24 to 10. Okay, so what? And then he's just got a great feel of, oh, shit, it's 24-14. Doesn't look like it's our night. All right, hold on. Let me put on the cape. Here I come. And then he just has a great feel to go, okay, now I'm going to push the envelope and start making some insane Aaron Rodgers throws. And that, to me, is... That's what a great quarterback can do. The night your team's asleep a little bit, not doing well, okay, messing some things up, the great quarterback can go, wait, guys, you know, relax, calm the f*** down. I got this. I'll get us back in. You guys get your shit together. And then they started to put it together in the second half. But, yeah, between that, going down four-play, 75-yard drive before the half, make it 24-21, and then they Belichicked them because they got the ball in the third quarter, and he went down on a great drive there, score a touchdown, right? They get the strip sack fumble on Justin Fields the next drive, and it was night-night Chicago, yeah. and Aaron Rodgers still owns you. Yeah, the Bears basically went three and out, I think, their first four possessions except they fumbled on the first possession so yeah, it was like right, two and out right uh so they really had a, a hard time in the second half uh green bay gets the win it, you know if aaron can't go maybe kurt kurt benkert can play so he played in this game because jordan love was unavailable covid protocols for jordan yeah, is that what it was so. yes yes uh benkert has bounced around the nfl since 2018 active for the first time ever and got to take in the final kneel downs. I think we have a tweet, and he tweeted out, Kurt <laughs> so Benkert, cool. well done, a Kurt dirty Benkert. knee. He's got, like, white paint on it. It must have been at midfield, I guess. Uh, who made you all creative like this? Uh, and so he went in the game and took the final kneel downs. Battle scores. Really cool. And we yeah. think we have a suspicion that maybe Aaron Rodgers orchestrated that. Yeah, I, I would think so. Rodgers is the type of guy that'd be like, hey, go get your name in the game book. Go take the snap here. I'm going to you know, put my hair in a ponytail and get ready for <laughs> you know, my post-game press conference with Catherine Tappan. Uh, but, yeah, he, he, uh, I, I, I would bet. Because I thought it was weird. I will say, I was sitting there watching. I was going, man, Rodgers didn't even just go out and take the kneel. Like the game's <laughs> right. over. But there probably was some, you know, thought out reason there by Aaron Rodgers. Damn okay to Kurt Benkert for taking a knee Way and getting go, a Kurt. dirty knee after the game. Damn okay to another quarterback, Patrick Mahomes. They beat the Raiders. He and the Chiefs 48-9. to This was a blowout. I think we have Mahomes versus the Raiders. And then versus everyone else. Ah. So in the two games versus the Raiders <laughs> since week five, 2-0, 332 yards per game. Everyone else, 251 yards per game. And look at the TDs to interception right. ratio. Right. Versus the other See? seven games against the NFL, six TDs, eight interceptions versus the Raiders, 7-0. and Bad news for the Chiefs. 
Probably not going to play the Raiders in the playoffs. <laughs> no, you're right. Good news is they did play them on Sunday. Yeah. Well, the Raiders classify as that team you know that annoys me, right? You know me. This is what we do. We just we do this and we execute it. We don't mess up. In That's what, great. In what respect? Well, they just they're very simplistic. It's Seattle cover three or it's man to man coverage. So what do you make of this though? We're, yeah. we're digging Pete dig, dug into yeah. some numbers. Mm -hmm. The Raiders use two deep safeties on 36% of Mahomes' dropbacks in Week 10, right. up to that to 70% so they played this little week. More, right, so they probably played a little more quarters this week. That will be interesting to see. I'm going to be interested to see that, yeah. Hey, you know, the, the Seattle cover three, they obviously had answers for it the first game around, so this is how they tried to change it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I thought it was efficient as, as Mahomes was the whole year. I mean, that's for sure. You know, they protected well. He stood in the pocket. seemed like he threw the ball pretty well throughout the day. You know, again, I, I'll be interested to see what those two safety defenses were. Sure. I really will, and I'll check that out uh, for sure. You know, even when the Raiders play a single safety defense, right, and they play cover three, it's – it's not an aggressive cover three where that third, that safety comes down to like linebacker level always. If you watch what Gus Bradley used to do with the Chargers, even when they would play a cover three, the safety would just rotate a little bit down. He wouldn't get so far down there that you're going to be able to run behind him and do that. But I will be interested to see that. The story of this game, Mahomes being efficient, great. The story of the game was the defense. Like, like the Cowboys – against Washington, like the Bucks did to Buffalo early in the first half, this was even to a greater extent of they were overwhelmed, physically whooped the crap out of the Raiders' offense. I mean, from the get-go, first play, strip, fumble, touchdown of the game. And then Derek Carr was under duress throughout. They dropped some footballs and then just made some stupid turnovers as the game went on. But the defense, again, was really the story in Kansas City. We always want to talk about Mahomes and company, but hey, seven and two since week five, you know, it, it's not because of the offense. It's ten points the per is game dominant. they're giving. Right. Only ten points per game they're giving up in the last six weeks. It's in your face. It's physical. It's got a great splash of creativity. Like I've talked about, I think they've got the right personnel in the right spots now. Finally, you know, they're not messing defensive calls up like they were early in the year it was a lot of bus coverages and things of that nature and uh, none of that's happening and they just uh, absolutely kicked the crap out of the Raiders yeah, Mike Hughes nine tackles a couple forced fumbles had that fumble return for a touchdown so give him a shout out one shout out to a Raider and this comes from tripod 2x damn okay Hunter Renfro just Hunter Renfro he says the Raiders don't deserve to be mentioned but how is this guy who looks like he could be the water boy always open yeah they he have is. A, they have a great offense that lends itself to the slot receiver a lot. You know, it, it, it's Gruden. He's got not, Gruden had nine million ways to throw this ball seven yards, six yards. I wish he would have had more ways to throw the ball 20 and 30 yards. But this is that's bread and butter for him. And, again, don't judge books by their cover. I mean, that's what all I could say. That position right there, you don't need to be, like, freaky in all areas. There's only one area you got to be freaky in you got to be quick and fast twitch. As long as you're able to move in short areas and be really explosive that way, ho, ho, I'm going to go this way and then go back out that way, that, that's what their life is, right? I'm going to fake the five-yard in route and then run out. And there's a guy that's covering him, and, of course, he's on an island, and it's, it's going to be impossible to cover a guy like that, let alone he has the smarts to understand coverages and do that. Uh, he did have a fumble during the game, right, where somebody punched oh, the ball out of him. Oh, jeez. We're trying yeah. to, like, you know, be sorry. nice to him here. They he, all had fumbles. <laughs> I mean, the tight end dropped the ball. got intercepted by Derek Carr. Oh, but that's, right. you know, again, when you get your ass whooped 41 to 10 the first time, I would say don't go jump on the other team's logo. Yeah. Right? That's let's let's, a bad idea. let's play like a competitive game first and then see <laughs> after the game or next time you play them. Yeah. But you can't get your ass whooped and then go, oh, we're going to come in here like we're the big bad bullies today. Yeah. You know, that was a, that they, was they a bad idea. They made two mistakes the last two times they've gone to Kansas City. Time before that, they upset them last year. Remember early in the year? Took the they, bus all around the right, stadium. Right. Right. I mean, that, that's it. from that I, Kansas City's been pissed off at the Raiders ever since then. Yeah. Ever since. Well, it showed. And it's not going to stop. It's not. They're going to remember that. It was, you know, a low blow move as, as far as Andy Reid of the Chiefs are concerned. So the Chiefs get the last laugh beating the Raiders there. Justin Herbert gets the last laugh against the New York Giants. Justin Herbert is amazing. He is in that upper echelon of quarterbacks right now, just like Patrick Mahomes. Yes, he is. Uh, let's take a look at the passing chart versus the Giants here, Kristen, if you have that, because the touchdown that he threw to Jared Guyton at the end of the first half 
is literally off the chart. You you can't even next gen stats has to make a new graphic to be able to chart that throw from Herbert. That is he's <laughs> I mean him Mahomes, Rodgers, Josh Allen, you know, who else am I missing? I mean there's Throwing the ball 70 yards in the air, I don't think is really that hard for them. So Jack F. says, is Justin Herbert the best deep thrower in the NFL right now? Yes, he is. He's not only in the discussion for the best thrower, period, in the NFL. Yeah, for... He for is the best. The best deep, deep ball thrower. thrower. And yeah, because even his bad throws are still in a spot where it's like, okay, it's 50-50 and this guy can still go get it. That's what he did a little bit in the Cincinnati game last week, right? Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I know you weren't here for the Wednesday What the F*** Happened podcast, but we basically broke down three plays where they took a shot and he just went, wait, this is a guy that's not as good as my guy. I'm going to put it up there and let him go get it. This play here yesterday, the deep one to uh, – it was Guyton, right? I mean, he scrambles yep. to the right a little bit, realizes, whoa, I got a guy running down the middle of the field between two split safeties and let it fly. I hope they continue to do that. I hope he continues to do that. They have the type of guys that can go up and catch those footballs. And like you've heard me say before, you know, when, they're, when they do that and he's aggressive and they call a few shots, it makes everything else on their offense really good. But this game here, it was this. Eckler and the run game were really good early on. And then, you know, I don't know whether it's things stayed the same on the Giants' defensive side or if they started to play different defenses. And but after those first two drives, then it became Justin Herbert kind of just lighting them up in the past game and seemed like they had their way that way. And of course, we know the Giants' offense is not capable of a whole lot right now. Well, hold on. Eli Penning, the, the Eli Penny, the touchdown catch was their first touchdown by a running back or a wide receiver since October. That's, so there you go. They're that's, back. That's embarrassing. That's They're embarrassing. Okay. That really is. I mean, it is, there's too much talent on that receiving core for that to be the case. Now, again, I'll go back to their biggest issue is they can't even a lot of times wait to throw the ball down the field because they can't protect long enough to do it. And that's one of their biggest issues. It affects everything about their football game. Um, so they're so undermanned in that department that it affects all these other areas that you know become crazy stats as we go along here. Giants are not going to make the playoffs. The no. Chargers right now the five seed at eight and five. They're ahead of five other seven and six teams. One of those seven and six teams, the Denver Broncos. As you take a look at the AFC playoff picture, there you got the Denver Broncos at seven and six. They're in the hunt right now. They get the win over the Detroit Lions in a game that really was focused around Demarius Thomas. You saw all the tributes before the yeah, game. Yeah, that was cool. Denver went out there with 10 men on the field, took the delay game. Right. Lions declined that penalty. And you saw after every big play, basically, there was an 88 on the field. The Denver Bronco players would go over there, pay tribute to Demarius Thomas, who tragically died at the age of 33 uh, just a few days ago. Man. I, did you know, did you meet him ever? Or I met him before, just in passing. I mean, nothing to Seems like wear. everyone says so many positive things about him. I mean, everybody seems to say he's the nicest guy in the world you yeah. know and, and and again we never saw anything other than that he always held held himself to a very professional level on the field and really there was never anything about him off the field you know had one of those faces that you know again was just like hey he looks like a nice guy like it's just you know one of those I don't well, know how enjoyed, you explain those. He enjoyed life. He sweet, enjoyed football. Sweet smile, yeah. sweet face, where you just looked at him. And, Man, it looks like he's a nice guy, right? And I know that can be wrong sometimes, but I don't think it was wrong in this case. And uh, other thing, I just I don't want to be under talked about here for the person he was and all that. Man, was he a good player? I mean, man, was he a good player? He is one of the best players of the 2010s for sure at the wide receiver position. I mean, special, you know, size. Real speed to catch screens or slants and go to the house or bombs down the field, you know had had it all. Really did. I mean, he was uh, Peyton's it's a shame. main man. There Peyton's for main a man when he got there, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, he's he was a mismatch nightmare type of guy. He really was, and uh, great career. Uh, it's it's a shame it it all came to an end yeah. too short. Paid tribute to him during the game, before the game, and then the Broncos paying tribute. By just dominating the Detroit Lions in this game, who were under banned. They had, I think, 18 oh players gosh, who were affected guys, either by COVID right. or the flu. So a separate thing that was going through the team. And so they were under manned in the game. But I think that the positive for the Denver Broncos here is that you got a good one-two punch with Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams. They used them both. And I feel like that's going to be, if they're going to get to the playoffs and make any sort of a run, it's going to be 
offensively, those guys. Yeah, it is. And and hey, listen, their run game is what it's, it is all about there. You know, again, the, the pass game doesn't lend itself to a lot of big plays. Again, I don't think it's in Teddy Bridgewater's nature to be aggressive and do that. And, you know, they got a pretty good O-line, and those two running backs are really good. And that's, I mean, they were rolling early on. Detroit had no answer for that. But even saying all of that, like Detroit hung around. They hung around. And there we go. It's... We're going into the third quarter, and it's seventeen to ten. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's seventeen to ten. And what 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 happened first? We had the the, um, the Detroit fumbled their second Detroit play. Detroit fumbled of the second, the second play, right? Yeah. I, I, uh, I, Iguibuke, I, I'm sorry if I'm saying it. Uh, he fumbles first, right? So now they go down twenty four to ten. Yep. And on the very next drive, they get a fourth and two at the thirty three. Oh boy, here we go. Again. And you know, jeez, oh, here we go again. Fourth and two at the 33. Their own 33. Right? And, like, even though we talked about the offense did good the first two drives and they put up points, they'd kind of settled in. It wasn't to the point where you're like, oh, man, they're never going to be able to stop Denver. It's 24 to 10. Fourth and two. Own 31. They get stopped. Denver scores a few plays later. Game's over. I mean, it's over. It's 31-10. You have Jared Goff and you're the Lions. It's over. I'm sorry. And that, to me, was a big mistake there. Just a little too over-aggressive, and I know you know you and me are in different spots about that one, but I don't agree with that one. I don't. Yep, Lions go down. Maybe they just they were, they were all getting tired. They were all getting tired because they had so few players to play out there. So Broncos get the win. They're in the playoff mix for sure. The Saints still in the playoff mix. They get the win over the Jets. 30-9 to was the final score. Our damn okay goes to Elvin Kamara. Of course. Because he returns in that losing streak magically goes away yeah. for New Orleans because he might be the most important non-quarterback to his team. We put, you know, Derrick Henry in that conversation. Right. We put Jonathan, Jonathan Taylor, Taylor in that conversation. Um, and with Taysom Hill at quarterback, you can do some different things. And I, I'm really excited to see this offense moving forward. Yeah. Like this is a fun offense to see because it's different than other offenses when you have a quarterback like Taysom Hill, who is a different kind of running quarterback. Yeah. It's than a power, the other running, power yeah, exactly. Running quarterback, right? It's like more of the Cam Newton mold, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think they can do here? Because Thomas S. Penna says, "Damn, okay for Taysom Hill. He, he receives a lot of hate from people saying he isn't a quarterback. However, even with an injured finger, almost no weapons, he went 15 to 21 for 175 yards and 73 rushing yards." Yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I got nothing to say that I'm, uh, I'm not a believer in Taysom Hill yet. You so are I, a believer. I'm a believer. You're a noted believer. Right. There's no, well, what, what is there? Like everyone's holding last week against the cow, but the guy broke his finger in the first quarter. And everybody's like, oh, look, he's not accurate. They're going to judge him on that. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to start judging your guy, your quarterbacks on some crazy shit. Now let's see what happens. You know, it, he's got a, he's got talent. He does. And he can be accurate. We saw that last year. With high degree of difficulty of throws, not Charlie check down four yard throws. So, again, that was what everybody liked about him in the offense in New Orleans last year. They went, whoa, the field gets stretched as compared to Drew Brees, who had lost arm strength, you know, late in his career. I mean, that's what everybody was liking. And he was still throwing for over 72% last year. But, you know, don't even get me started. You know where I want to go with this. Either way, <laughs> I share your excitement, okay? Because. They have a formula with Hill and Kamara that I think can make them a pain in the ass as we go forward here. You know, I don't know if they can get in the playoffs. You know, I know they have like the Bucks coming up this week, which is certainly going to be you know a tough match. But we know that they match up well with them. Dolphins, Panthers, Falcons. After that, they can certainly win those three games. You know, Dolphins are playing good football. It's going to be fun to see. But they can win those three. Their defense is still really good, and with the Kamara, their offensive line, and then Taysom Hill's ability to run. I do think Sean Payton, to your point, is going to be able to pose some schematical problems with those two off the run game. And then because of lack of receivers and things like that, he'll, he'll it'll 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 help the pass game. It will that little combination. So uh, I I'm not counting them out yet either. I'm not. You know, Sean Payton's too good of a coach. Dennis Allen's too good on the defensive side of the ball. Um, if they somehow pulled off an upset this weekend against Tampa Bay, yeah. wow, I'd sit here and go, whoa, I, they're, they're going to get in the playoffs then. Um, but even if they lose this week, I could certainly see them winning the three games at the end of the year or two to get in. Yeah, they're 6-7, six and seven, and a 6-7 and seven Washington team currently is in the playoffs right now in the yeah, NFC. So there you go. not out of it by any means. Uh, 
one question about the Jets. Lou yeah. from Astoria. Is Wilson still in your mind a franchise quarterback, or are the Jets just a lousy team? Oh, Lou, come on. You, you, you got, we got to stop making this all about the quarterback. Zach Wilson made some throws yesterday that I thought were off the charts good. They dropped, I want to say, five passes in the first half, at least something in that nature. I mean, again, they hung around against a really good Saints defense, a Saints defense that Tom Brady can't beat. Okay, let's just let's remember what we're talking about here. He beat him once in the playoffs, and he got a little fortunate that way. This Saints D is real. You know, where are they statistically in football right now? Let me look at this. The Saints defense, they're 12th in football right now, right? It's still one of the best run-stopping defenses in football, mm -hmm. and they only let up 21 points a game. They're good. You know, they're, they're, they're a top 10-ish defense in, in almost all areas. So, uh, and then, yeah, your offense is not that great. It's not. And your, you know, your defense is nothing special either. I still am a believer in where the Jets are going. I am. I think there's Overall, a lot of, I think there's a lot of pieces that are there. You know, again, they've been ravaged by injuries this year, as bad as anybody in football. Wilson's physical ability, Lou. That's all we got to look at. He's not going to be Tom Brady in year 12 yet, and not with this group and everything like that. I mean, he's thrown to Braxton Berrios as his main receiver. Nobody even wants Braxton Berrios in football. He's their main target. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful. I'm just trying to make a point. You know what I'm trying to say here. But, uh, yes, I like what I see from Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson still, out of all these quarterbacks, has made more wow throws than any of the other rookie quarterbacks. He has. And they ask him to make more wow throws than any of the other rookie quarterbacks. No, he hasn't played as clean as Mac Jones. I get that. I know he hasn't made as great scrambles as a Justin Fields. But from throwing in the pocket – to me, Zach Wilson has made more wow moments, and I go, ooh. And I know he's missed some, too. But that stuff is going to be – he'll fix that. I don't worry about that. I saw enough evidence in college to go, he'll hit that all day long. Things are uncomfortable. He's a young guy. They're not a great team, and it leads to some, some crazy moments. And to get Chris to say something bad about Zach Wilson, it would be like getting him to say something bad about – a little Philip, Philip Sims. But like I said son. bad when he played like no, shit. Know. When he was over in London and Atlanta, and he missed. There are some balls. throws that even he said in this game that were a little he, off he's target for a, him. He missed yeah. a few. Yeah, he tries to be a little too perfect at times. What I've uh, what I've said on the podcast, I think I said this last week, is he's got a uh, he gets himself in trouble when he tries to place the ball. Sure, just throw the ball through the. F target it's a learning year for him it is he's, a learning, he's year. learning but the talent you've right. seen it enough times exactly to, to know right. that it's there right it's just got to be refined right. time to give me the headlines presented by hyundai got three more games left we'll start with the titans shutout of the jags 20 to nothing your headline in this game is urban retreat oh Ooh. they're leaving the city of jackson he may be leaving the city of jacksonville <laughs> yes he might be you're right i, I don't know where that's gonna go I, I, mean, I think i know you I, think i how can they recover from I this. think most people in the NFL in the know in league circles tend to have your thought you know again I don't think they know but they tend to think that this is going to be a one and done thing with Urban Meyer it's been ugly you know the reports you heard over the weekend right about you know the way he talks to coaches and their leaks and whatever else I, I'm pretty sure I was saying these things in week three of the NFL season now, this is this has been going on all year long and yeah like, you want to say to Urban Meyer, yeah, you're, people are going to leak things when you treat them like shit always. When you call them losers, they may tell people that you're in calling them losers. In front of the losers. team, in front of the coaching staff. I've heard these stories from early on in the year. That's what he does. He t talks to coaches, I don't know why I hired you. You're a loser. You're not good. I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, that's just not the way the NFL works. Nor is it going to help the rest of your football team when they see your head coach demeaning their position coach. They're all going to look at the head coach and go, man, he's an asshole for doing that. And then they're also going to question the coach now who he just called a loser. And they go, oh, is he a loser? I don't know. It just it does no it serves no no positive, you know, uh, reinforcement for your football team there. But ugly game. Titans played D. They didn't take many chances on the offensive side of the ball. I don't think they really care. To me, the Titans are like the Patriots. They're just going to do what they have to do to win the football game. They don't care if it's 12 to 10 or 20 to nothing or whatever. Uh, I still think the Titans are one of the best teams in the AFC. I'm not giving up on that. And, yeah, they gave Trevor Lawrence and company some issues. Trevor Lawrence threw the four interceptions. Yeah, four, yeah. He could have thrown seven or eight yesterday. He really? had a bunch of others that just went off the chest of uh, Titans football players. More worried about Trevor Lawrence or Zach Wilson? You know, I'm not worried about either one. I'm really not. 
Um, they both miss, both miss throws. They should not. And they're both like mechanical issues that are very easy to fix. So I don't look at it and go, oh, wow, like they're, there's something there that I don't like about their throwing. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're both in offenses that are not exactly talent all over the field. They're young. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I got no concerns with Trevor Lawrence. Okay. I really don't. But they were overmatched yesterday. Tennessee – Offensive line legit, defensive line phenomenal, secondary very good too. You know, I, I'm I'm like I said, a believer in the the Tennessee Titans. We were at one point a believer in the Carolina Panthers, at least that defense. Uh, but that has changed now. The Falcons beat the Panthers 29-21. Your headline on this game is no Cam do. Oh yeah, no Cam do. I, I mean, well. Panthers mistakes were huge. I don't know what else to say. And they were both cam mistakes. You know, I I, I know um you know the uh the other quarterback that came in the PJ Walker PJ Walker, in. thank you. He threw a stupid interception, which I don't even know why he was in the game at the end of the half. It's like so, they put uh, him in to run the two point the two minute I, drill. I, it might be that. It might be that. I think there's there's some word out of Carolina that maybe Cam hasn't picked up the whole playbook, especially the two minute part of it. Right. So it's like, yeah, he they benched him at the end of the first half. Cam started the second half, but then they did go back to PJ Walker in the second half. Yeah, they uh, went back. Yeah, later in the in the second half. I know. Well, I mean, hey, seven seven. Carolina had a great first drive, few screens. Cam made a throw or two. They had some quarterback design runs. They go down, score a touchdown. Things look good. You know, I think. You know, I think Atlanta got the ball. They punted back to K- Panthers. The Panthers punt the ball back to Atlanta. Atlanta goes down and scores. You got a 7-7 football game. And then there was Carolina driving down the football field again. And he throws, Cam throws a ball over the middle, gets p- interception, pick six. And that really changed the flow of the game altogether. I mean, it certainly put Atlanta in a power spot there. And they ended up ultimately going up 17-7 at a half. But then they fight back. Their defense keeps them in it. Carolina's defense is still, like, legit. And he has the tripped fumble yeah, trying to hand trying, the ball trying off. Trying to do too much, trying to save the play yeah. and ends up turning it over. And that, that, that changed it all. It really did. Listen, I don't know how Atlanta keeps winning these games. <laughs> I really don't. They're, it's like they're in the playoff. They're, they're gritty six and, and gutsy. Right. They're six and seven right now. Washington, in, like we said, in the playoffs at six and seven. So they're in the playoff picture, but I feel like no one really wants Atlanta to be in the playoffs. I don't. Even, even their fans are just like, you know what? No. We don't want this. I, I respect this it. They're well coached on both sides of the ball. Matt Ryan is still really good, and you can't get him off the field on third downs. I mean, to me, that's the thing he does where, yeah, it was, you know, 29 points yesterday, and one of them was a defensive touchdown. But the one thing he will do is he possesses the, he, he possesses the ball on that side of the ball because he's still a great decision maker. He's still a great thrower of the ball. And his movement in the pocket is always underrated to where third down, it's third and nine and you think they got him and he kind of moves around in the pocket and hits an in cut for 15 yards he is the king of that um but yeah good for them for winning the football game where i don't even know if they're more talented than carolina i just think they got good coaches and they got the better quarterback on the football field and that led to the eight point victory Yeah, atlanta's a game ahead of seattle who's not out of it yet seattle gets a win their fifth win this year beating the texans 33 to 13 your headline on this game is penny lockett Penny lock. Is that a real thing? Have we figured that out? We don't know. It's oh, a wait. Penny. Oh, hold on. We have see? a picture. Of I knew it. it was. I knew it was a so, penny lock. So Pete comes in today before you got in because Chris, you know, to let you behind the curtain, uh, I'm always late on late, Mondays. A few minutes late. I'm on always Monday. late. Uh, and Pete goes, I thought of a headline, maybe Penny Lock. And he goes, but I don't know if that's a real thing. You come in, you know, 30 to 45 minutes later, and you, maybe it was an hour and a half later. <laughs> and you go, you go, hey, I think we should do a headline Penny Lock. It. And Pete goes, is that a thing? And you go, I don't know, but it sounds like it I should think be. it is. I feel like I've seen it, it before is. where like, people have it. a lucky penny. penny yeah, or we right? just saw they, it. There it is. There it is. So that, Bam. That's it. So it was... It was it was Penny and it was Lock Tyler it. Lockett. <laughs> uh, so it, they both went off, and it was good to see. Penny. I know you have been a longtime supporter of I, Rashad I, Penny. I do like his talent. He's just been hurt. Yeah, was not hurt in this game. Went off, and they got the win. Yeah, good, good for him. I mean, you know, and and hopefully he could stay healthy. You could see his talent. He's got size and explosive ability. You know, two long touchdown runs in the football game. Hey, that Seattle offense. It's still not pretty to watch. We know that. You know, this game early on, both quarterbacks played really well. Davis Mills, I think, what did you say he was, 14 for 14 to start last yeah, night, right? Yep. You know, they kind of moved the ball. 
did some positive things there, but you know, ultimately there's just not enough talent on the, on the Texans yet. There's really not. And Russell Wilson and company and just their, their stubbornness to not go away. Uh, they finally got it going and he started making some big plays in the past game, but yeah, it was all the locket and Rashad Penny show. Mm -hmm. They made all the big plays for that, that, uh, Seahawks offense. If they went out, they're a playoff team. I don't know if they're gonna be able to do that, but let's say yeah. What, what their their schedule went out. Let's let's just give it a quick look we, here. I think we looked I think at we it last looked week at it last and we were week. like probably not gonna happen. But yeah, hey. Rams, Bears, okay. Lions, Cardinals. Well, no. they could get lucky to where the Cardinals don't have to play anything in week right? eighteen. So then all you gotta do is beat the Rams. If you beat the Rams. Oh my gosh, right. they can still do it. That would be the upset. All right, in L.A. I don't like their chances, but no. I'm never gonna count Seattle out. Seattle's like Baltimore. It's just they're always going to fight and play with incredible intensity, and they're battle-tested, and they understand, for the most part, kind of how to manage a game that way, and that's why they're, they're a hard out always. And that was Give Me the Headlines presented by Hyundai. And with that loss, the Texans were officially eliminated from the playoffs. And so for the first time this year, for the first time, in 2021, because I don't know if we did it at the end of last year. Maybe we did. Uh, it is time. Oh, we did. Yeah. Okay. So for the second time in 2021, we fire up Requiem for a team. We put to rest the teams that have been eliminated, and it's four teams, the Texans, Jaguars, Jets, and Lions. So, Kristen, do we have the music? Do we still have that? To Oh, it's the music's not working. That's okay. We don't need it. So if you're at home right now. You didn't you write have, a song? You can't hum to something? Like you have, I thought you well, it's like beatboxing. I have to hum and do the poem at the same time. I'm not Because yeah, I'm not helping you. I'm not that good. Yeah. All right, so here we go. The Houston Texans. You ready for it? Yep. The, here lie the Houston Texans. We knew this year'd be a wreck. David Culley was handed a bad deck. Not all was great, but they can celebrate. Davis Mills with the league's longest neck. <laughs> one thing. One, you know, they're at the top of the one league. One thing. We got the quarterback with the longest neck. <laughs> That's it. That's it. All right, Jacksonville Jaguars. You ready? Goodbye, Houston. Here lie the Jacksonville Jaguars. Yeah, goodbye, Houston. Too many times they played from behind, and Trevor at times did look blind. Urban was bad, but I'm not even mad. At least we got to see him grind. Oh, uh, I was waiting right, for right. it. Man, <laughs> you could have added grind in there like three different times. I was like, where is it? Come on. <laughs> Throw it in there. Yeah, it just made you wait till the very end. And, I mean, is Davis Mills' neck longer than Trevor Lawrence? I'm not sure. It's oh, a close one. Or, you know, the only other neck I thought about was Mike Glennon. Oh, Mike Glennon, right. I know. No but doubt. give him something. Give the Texans. We just buried them. <laughs> give him the quarterback with the longest neck. I'm okay. going to give it to him. All right, fine. All right, so so <laughs> Texans are buried. Jaguars are buried. All right, how about the Jets? You ready? Yep. All right, here lie the New York Jets. Despite their name, it's a team that cannot take flight. Their talent level is still quite light. But do not despair. They have their quarterback air, and he goes by the name Mike White. <laughs> there we go. They got a quarterback of the You're future. You're funny. You're funny. Uh, and uh, the final one, right. my Detroit Lions, final one right now. Here lie the Detroit Lions. Dan Campbell was given the keys, knowing this would not be a breeze. They did get a win, but to my chagrin, they did not bite enough knees. Oh, not enough knees. You are good. Bitten throughout the year. So we, we laid a rest. Some nibbling, not some, some biting. Some nibbling. Yeah. They got some nibbling, but no no biting. So those teams are dead. Dead. And they've been buried now. Yeah. They're gone. See you later. We're not so, talking about you anymore. You're gone. You're off my radar. We're not no more Monday podcasts. So that's the good thing. If your yeah. team is eliminated, that's right. bad, right? right? But you know, I'm going to make a poem about them the next day. Yeah, I like it. So there it. we go. I know you're a good poem writer. One more game to go. We're not going to bury the Rams or the Cardinals anytime soon. And so that's our last game to talk about. Points bet gives us the odds for our Monday night football game, and it is what is it here? It is. Cardinals by two yeah. in what they think is going to be a high-scoring game, 51 over under. Yeah. So um, you picked Arizona to win this game. Yeah, I Are you sticking Arizona, by that? I am. I, I don't ever change. I'm going to pick Arizona 24-21. Uh, you know, again, I do think the Rams match up well with Arizona, that they can match up and take some of these weapons away. They have speed on the defensive side of the ball. Um, but I don't trust the Rams right now. To me – the defense is not shown to be dominant, really. They're good. They're not dominant. 
the offense, I know they looked better last week against the Jacksonville Jaguars, but it was the Jaguars. And again, what I like to tell everybody is they'll suffer. I mean, it was 10-7, like more than halfway through the second quarter. It wasn't like they were like, oh, wow, this is, this is over. Um, so I guess that's where I don't trust it. You know, again, like I said, I think there's a lot of things that are very equal here, but one team seems to have the mojo of kind of just making big plays, you know, showing up at the right moments, and the Rams, they don't right now. So I just – I don't know what to expect. I need to see another game of, like, clean offensive play by the Rams, and I want to see if their defensive line can show up here. To me, that's been one of the more disappointing things in football. Like you've heard me say Cleveland's too talented to be where they are. The Rams' defensive line is too talented uh, for the lack of chaos they have created for opposing quarterbacks ever since they acquired Von Miller, which is disappointing to me. I think this is the game where my guy Matt Stafford and you the Rams make a statement. Back. I, I think so. I, 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 We've listen, seen some signs. I'd hope so. It'd be fun. It'd make things interesting in the NFC. It would, Certainly. Yeah. And they have talent to say well, they should be in the discussion for one of the top teams in the NFC. Right. But they lost their way there a little bit. We'll see if they can regain that mojo tonight. All right. That's it. We've done hey, it. Hey, hey. You heard the yep. poems. Yep. <laughs> yep, it was. It was awesome. All right. So we already have positive reviews on positive the poems. Positive reviews from the guy that you want to get a positive review exactly. from. Right. I exactly. Know. Luckily, we didn't have to bury the Patriots. No. We won't have to. <laughs> yeah, he was complimenting him. Right, right. I know. Yes, thank you. Yeah, don't take my compliment. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right, that's it. We did it. We did it. That's a pod. And, and Kristen, we did it all in an hour and a half, right? Kind of. No. Uh, Probably sort an hour of. 40. Pizza, sort of. Hour 40. Was it an hour 40? I'm going to say it was. You can't get you to stop blabbering. You know, it's just a problem <laughs> on this podcast. Amin won't shut the yeah. f up. Yeah. That's all right, though. Yeah, it's all right. You're the man. Chance is that. We You're did it. Man. We did it. We made yep. it through. Two You're shows in 14 hours. I Look know. We've seen a lot. We, this is what happened. We see a lot of each other. Yes. But yeah, it's good. Yeah, it is good. We're now, still laughing now by the end stay away from me for the rest of the week, all right? Please. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. You know what the deal is. Subscribe, rate, review. Got Chris Sims unbutton. What the f*** happened? Wednesday podcast coming up. You know, we're going to have that. I, I'd like more questions or or just, you know, intrigue onto what plays you want me to break down. So, please, like, don't be shy. Come on, do that. Uh, had a good, pretty good week of picking games this week. Uh, pretty I'm, good. Pretty you good. picked them all right. I picked winner. them all right as far as wins and losses yeah. versus the spread. I the think money I'm line, 11 you picked and two. them all. 11 and 2 versus the Three spread. 3-0 in my best bets. Wow, Me and Florio have been pretty good with our very best good. bets as of late. We do that on Thursday, the PFTPM Chris Sims Unbutton Collaboration Podcast, if anybody wants to check that out. All right, everybody, be good. Enjoy Monday Night Football. It should be a good one. Please send in the questions. Ahmed Farid, you the man. Chris Sims Unbutton, presented by Under Armour. We love you, Under Armour. Clap, Clap it, it up. up. Yo, yo, what's up? Come on, man. Subscribe on YouTube to Chris Sims Unbutton Podcast. I need you. Please hit the subscribe button, please. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.